It is my pleasure as the academic dean of the seminary to welcome you to Emanuel Christian Seminary at Milligan College and to the Ross Smith Lectureships uh, in Pastoral Care. This marks the third consecutive year of presentation for these lectures, which began in 2013. Endowed by Dr. Calvin and Nancy Ross, these lectures serve as a legacy to the pastoral work of the church and in memory of Calvin's parents, Walter and Mardell Ross. This year, upon the 2014 passing of Frank Smith, Nancy's father, the lectures have been renamed in his honor as well. These lectures are intended to focus on the theory and practice of pastoral care relative to a, to a contemporary theme and to create interdisciplinary conversation for effective teamwork among ministers, students, educators, laity, medical practitioners, and peace and justice advocates. With gratitude for the generous gift that makes these le lectureships possible, I now welcome Dr. Calvin Ross to the podium to welcome our keynote speaker. I want to uh, right away acknowledge uh, Hilda Smith, and my mother-in-law. She's one of the Smiths from the Ross Smith Lectures, uh, Nancy's mother. Glad you're here, Hilda. <clears throat> About a year and a half ago, I saw on the front page of one of the sections of USA Today an article with photos about a physician dealing with issues of addiction and recovery. I looked a little more closely and the physician was from Johnson City, Tennessee. Then I noticed it was Stephen Lloyd, a good friend of our son Dan. They were in medical school together and one of my uh, colleagues and friends uh, from days at uh, Mountain States Health Alliance. I've always been impressed with uh, Dr. Lloyd's professional and educational achievements, and you'll notice those uh, in the uh, brochure in his bio section. I'm more impressed and proud of Steve for his willingness and his courage to turn to his own severe personal issues and to walk with other pilgrims on their pathway to recovery and health. Nancy and I could not be more delighted than to have him as our keynote presenter for the lectureship this year, Dr. Stephen Lloyd. I was going to try to sit down, but that's, that's just not going to work. Uh, not going to work at all. Thanks, Calvin. That was very kind. Um, if you told me when I was in medical school that I would be standing, uh, standing here talking about what we're getting ready to talk about, uh, I would have, uh, have thought you'd completely lost your mind. When you're in medical school in your second and third year, you're starting to decide, you know, what are you going to do with your life? You're going to be a surgeon, a family medicine doctor. Are you going to, you know, do a, be a psychiatrist? Uh, I can promise you that, that my list that I had, uh, nowhere on it was addiction medicine. First of all, I didn't even know addiction medicine was a specialty. Second of all, the only thing I knew about people with addiction is that none of them ever got better. We saw them in the ER all the time. Uh, we treated them very poorly, and we kicked them out. That's about what I knew uh, about addiction. Yet, standing here in front of you today, I can tell you that I've never had more fun in my life than doing addiction medicine. This is it. This is where it is. I'm the chief of medicine at the Mountain Home VA, and I love taking care of veteran patients. Uh, I do it every day. This is what I do for fun, because it's fun. You get to watch people's lives change. I tell folks all the time, if you take somebody with congestive heart failure, and, 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 you know, they're 70 years old or 75 years old, and you're giving them an ACE inhibitor, okay? They're going to get five good quality years of life that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And that's a good thing. I'm not knocking that at all. But if you intervene on someone with addictive disease and you get them help, most of these folks are young. You're going to give them 50 years of life. You're going to give them a life that they never dreamed of. You'll give them the life that, that Steve Lloyd was lucky enough to have. Whenever Calvin first asked me about doing this and he told me he wanted, to tell, wanted me to tell my story, I, I laughed because the first thing that popped into my mind was Daryl Smith. And Daryl's my patient. And we're going to get to Daryl and his wife, Misty, uh, here shortly. And, and to be honest with you, 
uh, their stuff is about a thousand times better than mine, at least. Okay? Because I look back, and, and if I'm not able to at least have a chance to make it with all that I was given, then I'm a moron. I really am. And I'm going to explain that to you here in just a moment. I was given everything. I was pulled aside. I was intervened on. I was sent to a really nice place to undergo medical detox from opiate narcotics and alcohol and benzodiazepines. Um, I spent 90 days at a, at a top-notch treatment facility in Nashville, Tennessee. A guy named Chip Dodd changed my life. Afterwards, I got to come home. I got to go back in my job. The university president at the time, Dr. Paul Stanton, paid me the whole time I was gone. He didn't fire me. The dean of my medical school, Ron Franks, did the same. I came back into my same job that I had that I'd always wanted before I, I got brought to my knees by addictive disease. I had the, the advocacy and support of peers. One of those peers is sitting here in, in the second row, Dr. Jack Woodside in the Tennessee Medical Foundation. I really didn't struggle for anything. And, and so I'm not minimizing what the process was like, but I can tell you, and what I wanted to do with this talk today is show you the difference of, of, of how treatment can be. What's the difference between me and, and Daryl Smith and, and his wife, Misty? What's the difference in us? Well, as human beings, almost none. Our stories are remarkably similar, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But whenever it came time to get help for our addictive disease, Daryl Smith's treatment was jail. Daryl got to go to prison twice. I got to go to Nashville, Tennessee, to Vanderbilt University, and a treatment facility. Now, Daryl wound up where Daryl wound up here today, obviously by the grace of God and by his own hard work. I wound up here because the system was set up to put me back here. And if you don't take anything else away from what I'm going to tell you today, I would hope that you would look at this a little bit differently because I'm not special. There's a million guys out there like me, a million women out there like me, very few people, I think, like Daryl Smith. And I think if we give people the opportunity the chance at treatment, the chance at rehab, the chance at meaningful relationship, because the opposite of addiction is not recovery. The opposite of addiction is relationship. If we give people meaningful relationship, we're going to see a lot more successes. Guys, addictive disease is the number one health problem in the United States. I got Rob Pack right here on the front row from our College of Public Health. Rob, if it's not uh, number one, it's got to be close, right? And if you throw hepatitis C in there, and combine the two, I'll guarantee it's number one. Yet what are we doing about it? What are our conceptions that we have in our mind about addiction and people with addiction? Are we locked down in the way people have always thought about it as a moral issue? Or are we willing to open up our minds and look and see what works? And I hope that we be, will be willing to open our minds and let's look at what works. Because guys, the only thing in the treatment of addictive disease that matters is outcomes. I don't care about anything else. The only thing that matters is outcomes. And if you look at this, and you look at what people understand about addiction, it, it's, it, it, it really is heartbreaking at times. Two of our presidential candidates, uh, I was trying to think, Rand Paul and Jeb Bush, were in New Hampshire, and they were surprised by the questions that, I'm sorry, my mouth's getting dry. They were surprised by the questions that they had gotten on heroin. And I was thinking, how in the world can you be surprised at this? First of all, Rand Paul, you're from the state of Kentucky. Marijuana is one of the five major food groups of the state of Kentucky. <laughs> right? Uh, Daryl, where are you from? Kentucky. Okay, if you're, if you're going to put ground zero in the, in, the opiate, uh, in the opiate addiction epidemic going on in the United States, you'd put it in eastern Kentucky and southwest Virginia. Rand Paul, that's your state. How can you not understand this? Uh, Jeb Bush. Jeb, you were the governor of the state of Florida when the pill mills were at their height. You inoculated the entire east coast of the United States with opiate and narcotics. Are you awake? Okay, and I ain't got anything against either one of those guys, but it just amazes me. We have more people now that die of drug overdose in the United States than we do of car accidents. And for, for two presidential candidates to not know why we wanted to talk about heroin or why they were getting about questions about heroin are people who are just out of touch. The thing I love most about addiction medicine, the thing I love most about knowing people like Daryl Smith, I only get out of touch for a little while, and then I get brought right back in, and it's wonderful. Guys, I hope, I hope that you, uh, hope to enjoy, you, you enjoy what we have to talk about today. And the first thing I want to talk about is basically everything that, that you guys probably have in your mind about addiction is probably wrong, just like mine was. 
When I was, when I was intervened on, I thought it's because I hadn't went to church enough. I hadn't helped enough little old ladies across the street. You know, I should have listened to my grandmother more. You know, there were a lot of reasons that, that I thought that I, was, uh, that I was struggling with addiction. I thought I had an underlying mental illness. Mental illness runs rampant in my family, so I thought I had bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or anxiety disorder, when it really turns out that I have addictive disease. But I didn't know any of that. Disease, this wasn't a disease. How could it be a disease if I voluntarily do it to myself? So I, I want to I expand on that a little bit as we go through our stories and, and help you to see that we are dealing with a disease, and we're dealing with a powerful disease. And we're dealing with a disease that can hijack the reward system in our, in our brains, my brain, Daryl's brain, to the point that the most important things in our lives, our kids, most important thing in any mom or dad's life is their kids. You take a bullet for them. Yet somehow our reward system gets hijacked. And then all of a sudden the most important thing in your life is what we were talking about this morning becomes the drug. It becomes the opiate narcotic. It becomes the pill. It becomes heroin. It becomes benzodiazepines. And the kids move down on the list. And that happened to me, and it happened to Daryl Smith. I want to tell you a little story about, about Rat Park because really what we're going to talk about today is Rat Park. So most of you have, have heard the experiments they did where they took the rat and they put him in a cage and they gave the rat water and water with cocaine, okay? And gave the rat a choice. And the rat went immediately to the water with cocaine after he had a taste of it, and he prefer, preferentially drank that water with cocaine to the point that he died. And everybody's going, oh, look how powerful, you know, this drug is. It caused addiction to the point that they forgo food on their own, water or uh, food, uh, food and water on their own, and die because they want to do this drug. It's got to be the drug. It would be nice if it was that simple. It's not that simple. And that was proved by some, some smarter guys who came along later and went, well, maybe the rat just didn't have any good options, right? We gave him water, and we gave him water with cocaine, but we didn't give him anything uh, for, uh, to do that rats like to do. Okay, so they put the, put the rat back in the cage with the water and the cocaine, and they gave him some rat things to do. They put one of those wheels in there. You know, rats like to run on the wheel. So they put the wheel in there, put some of the, the fluffy stuff. Rats like to tunnel, so they put some of that stuff in there so the rat could, rat could dig around. And they put a female rat in there. Now there's a kicker, right? <laughs> so now the rat has some companionship, all right? Guess what? The rat no longer preferred the cocaine and water. He actually preferred the water, the female companionship, or the female rat. He liked that wheel, and he liked to dig around and dig tunnels. What the heck does that have to do with addiction? Well, we did the same thing in Vietnam. Social experiment uh, happened by accident. But if you look at our soldiers in Vietnam, when we'd have congressmen go to Vietnam in the early 1970s, they came back freaking out. But they thought that we were going to have a heroin epidemic in the United States because most of our soldiers over there, or a lot of our soldiers over there, were using heroin. I thought they'd come back to the United States. What in the world are we going to do with all of them? Start setting up methadone clinics, treatment facilities. We're going to have this glut. Well, guess what? Our soldiers come back, and the most of them went back to their lives. Why? Because in Southeast Asia, they're sitting around in a, in a rice paddy up to their neck in water getting shot at. They're lonely. Right? The rat park. They had cocaine and water and, 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 and just water. So they took the cocaine and water, which is probably what I'd have done. But then when they came back home, they were back in their lives. They were back in their jobs. They were back in relationship. The key to treatment of addiction, any addiction, is relationship. They were back in relationship. So our soldiers in Vietnam provided a human rat park for us. By accident, but provided a human rat park. And as you listen to Daryl's story as I talk to him here in just a moment, I want you to understand his Rat Park. I put everything in terms of Rat Park. It's not as easy as these drugs are powerful, they're hijacking our brain, they're taking over our reward system. It's not that simple. This is a complex disease, and that's, it involves all of us. And, and if you look at it as just, well, we need to get rid of these drugs, well, that's not going to solve the problem. The problem is lack of relationship. One of the founders of AA, uh, uh, Bill Wilson, said that he realized that his addiction to alcohol came from his complete inability to form a, a meaningful relationship with another human being. Wow. Because what happens whenever you, can't, when you don't have those meaningful, healthy relationships is that you turn to a substance and that takes the void that, that would have been filled by a meaningful relationship. And guys, that's where we came in. And I'm going to tell you this. When I went to rehab, uh, I, was in no way, uh, I was in no way something I would consider a, a strong Christian at all. Matter of fact, I was an agnostic at best and an atheist at worst. If there was a God, I sure didn't see him. And when I did see him, most of the time I was hacked off at him for something. 
So that's the way I went into this. And then when I got into, into, into recovery and into treatment, and they're telling me a big part of this is going to be my spirituality, I thought I was in trouble. I thought, well, I'm just going to die. Right? But what I came to realize is that, that I, I'm not the bright light variety. Okay? God hasn't talked to me on top of a mountaintop. Uh, he's not talked to me in a burning bush. I mean, I got no experience with any of that. I ain't ever seen him. Okay? But I can tell you this. I'm a slow drip variety. And I learned to see God in other people. That's what you all are. That's what I told Daryl about coming in here today. You're nervous, and he's nervous. I'm nervous. I'm always nervous when I speak before folks. But when I got back and I started to see people's reaction to me as, as, as we got more and more into addiction medicine, more and more into helping people with addictive disease, and how open-hearted and kind they were and how much they wanted to help other people, guys, I, 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 gained, uh, I gained a renewed zest for my fellow human being. Because I think the world is a good place overall. And I think there's a lot of people out there that want to do good. All we see are the people who just want to do harm. Um, so as we go through this and you, and you listen to me and, and we get into Daryl and Misty for a little bit, I want you to think about their rat parks. How are their rat parks different? How, are, how is my rat park, Steve Lloyd, different from Daryl and Misty Smith's rat park? Because that's where the difference is. We're going to talk about medication a little bit. Medication is part of the, part of the deal here. And it's the other reason that I wanted you uh, to meet Daryl. Because I got high-quality rehab. I spent five and a half days at the Vanderbilt Institute for Treatment of Addiction. That cost me about 12 grand cash up front. No insurance. 12 grand. And then I went to the Center for Professional Excellence. 90 days. $35,000. Cash up front. Okay. It's so every bit of the money I had, and by gosh, that's the best $48,000 I ever spent in my life, all right? But how would Daryl be able to, to afford that at the time that he was in trouble? It might as well be a million dollars. Look at our rat parks. My drug addiction started when I was a kid, the first time I ever used alcohol. I was 12 or 13 years old, and I can't remember. I remember exactly where I was. Those of you from around here, Ed, I was in uh, Jonesboro behind Lavender's Market. All right, there should be a little alley back there. All right, all right. My cousin Pat Lee had hijacked some moonshine uh, from our uncle, and we were back there, and I took a drink of that stuff, and it burned all the way to my toes. I thought, man, that's terrible. I'm never going to do that again. Man, I wish that I had heeded those words because I obviously didn't do that. But from the first time I drank, I liked the way it made me feel. Uh, I became a problem drinker uh, probably in late high school. And then through the University of Tennessee, my, my friends in, in college used to laugh and kid me about how much I could drink and still make good grades. Because I figured out a long time ago, if you want to keep people off your rear end, make good grades. They won't say anything to you. That's it. So I drank my way through UT. I did well enough uh, at UT to have a chance to go to medical school later on. Uh, I got married about a year out of college. I married uh, Karen Tui from Johnson City. I met her when I was a sophomore. And uh, I thought when I got married, you know, I'll settle down. All right? I won't drink as much. But that didn't happen. My drinking continued, and, and probably it, it, it got worse. We used to go to UT football games, and, and uh, there was a young lady in the Georgia shirt over here, by the way. We, we beat you Saturday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we go to UT football games, and Karen would beg me not to drink. Don't drink. I said, I'll just have one. But that one always turned into two, three, four, five, and next thing I know, I missed the entire season. I couldn't remember any plays. And so my drinking was, was always different than, than my friends' drinking. Um, I spent four years outside of college working before I went back to medical school. And when I went back to medical school, uh, I, I, was, I knew I had a problem drinking, but you know, I thought, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. I'm in med school now. I'll be studying a lot. But a weird thing happened on the second day of medical school. My classmates elected me their class president. And my classmates, I mean, there's nobody I admire in the world uh, more than them today. And, and I thought, man, I can't let them see me drink. Uh, that's just not going to happen. So for the next four years, I did not touch alcohol because I did not want to see my classmates' uh, reaction when they saw me drink. But at the end of medical school, residency comes along, and they spread all across the country, and, and suddenly no longer, uh, no longer are they around. I picked up alcohol within a few months. Uh, I was in, got into residency, uh, drank through the first part of residency, and, and I've had two kids by now. I had my son Heath in 94 and had my daughter Haley in 1997. Karen and I are still married. And my last year of residency, things were, were pretty tough. I was working, I was moonlighting at Lakeshore Mental Health Institute. I was trying to decide what I was going to do with my life. 
And uh, life was pretty stressful. It was pretty stressful. We didn't have work hour restrictions back then, and so I was working, uh, you know, close to 100 hours a week. And on my way home one day, I was sitting, uh, sitting down on uh, Market Street right in front of Colonel Steve's Liquor Store. And uh, I reached over for some reason to Red Light and opened my glove box. And I'm still not sure why I opened it, but when I did, there was a couple of pills and package fell out. And there were Lord tabs that I'd gotten from my dentist. And, you know, it had been months ago, and I'd never had an issue with, with, with opiate narcotics. And I thought, man, I wonder what it's like to take these things. I see my patients taking them all the time. So I broke one of them in half. It was blue. I broke it in half, so it's two and a half milligrams. I threw it in my mouth. At the time, I was living out in Boone's Creek, so it was about a 15-minute drive home. And by the time I got home, I, found, I, I, I thought that I'd found a cure for my depression and anxiety. I suddenly felt at ease. I was like, oh, gosh, this is it. And I remember how happy I was. I was like, man, I'm not going to have to struggle with this anymore. I'll just take these things. Okay? Despite uh, all that I knew, despite the people that I saw who had become addicted to them and who had lost their lives in drug overdoses and watched families ruined, none of that stuff went through my mind. The only thing that went through my mind was I have found something to relieve my anxiety and depression. Within three and a half years, that half of a five milligram Lortab had grown to 500 milligrams of oxycodone a day. So I want you to think about that for a second. How much is 500 milligrams? Well, if we use Vicodin, which is what probably everybody in the room can relate to, that's 100 Vicodin a day. Every day. Every day. Guys, I didn't start out that way. I didn't start out to, to take 500 milligrams of oxycodone per day. I was living my dream. I'd always wanted to be a doctor, and here I was. I was a doctor. Uh, I love teaching. Uh, when I found out that they needed people to teach doctors, there wasn't anything else I ever wanted to do. I never even interviewed for another job. I married the girl that I met when we were sophomore freshmen in college. I lived in the house, or soon to live in the house that, that we dreamed of since, uh, since I met her. It's her family home. It's where I still live today. I had two kids, a boy and a girl. I never wanted for money. I had everything that I wanted. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if you come from where I come from or where in just a little bit we find out that, that Daryl Smith came from. So I want you to imagine having to have 100 pills a day. Uh, and, and some of this stuff, and one of the things I'm getting ready to tell you, I've never told in, in public before. But when you have to have 100 pills a day to keep from getting deathly ill, the first time I got deathly ill, I didn't know what it was. I was actually in Carter County. I was in Carter County, and, and I hadn't had pills in a couple of days, and suddenly I started getting sick. And I thought, what in the world's wrong with me? I've got the flu. And I started feeling worse and worse and worse. I had no clue what it was. And I went home. I got into bed. I had these shaking chills, these sweats. And I wasn't getting better. And then I got my hands on the opiates, threw the opiate back in my mouth, and all of a sudden I was better like that. And I was like, uh-oh, I know what this is. I was going through drug withdrawals. How does a guy go all the way through college, medical school, and residency and doesn't know what drug withdrawals from opiates is? How does a guy like that not know where to go for treatment? I'm one of the most educated guys in the country. Right? I mean, I've got to be at least in the top 5%. How could I not know? Then how in the world can we expect folks out there who don't have any of that to know what to do, to where to ask for help, because those places for help are few and far between. Getting my hands on 700 pills a week, my worst fear was going on vacation. How in the world am I going to get 700 pills? Right? I didn't want to go on vacation because I was going to get there. I'm not going to know where to get my pills. Every day that I woke up, it was about a pill. I got to have enough pills for today. And I get my hands on them, and oh, I could breathe for a little while, but I knew it was going to be a matter of time before I needed it again. It never, ever stopped. And there was the change. You want to talk about the change? That was it. One time I was, uh, I'd gotten my hands on 700, a little over 800, I think it was 800 oxycodone. And I was glad because I was getting ready to go to the beach. And we got to the beach, and I took more than I needed to. I took more than 100 a day, so I ran out on Thursday. And so I'm desperate. I'm at the beach. I'm with all my friends and family. Our kids are playing together on the beach. Heath and Haley are little. And I'm withdrawing from dope. So I got in my car. I had on my, my swim trunks, real long swim trunks, and a, and, a, and a T-shirt. that had the sleeves cut out of it and a pair of flip-flops. And I drove around to doctor's offices, and I couldn't find anywhere. I finally went to the pharmacy there. There's a pharmacy where we go to the beach right across the street from the hotel. And I could literally look across the street and I could see the kids playing on the beach with our other friends' kids. There's 20 of us that go to the beach. We still go. I could see them playing right there. And I'm a, I'm a gun toter, okay? I still am. Uh, so if there's anybody against that, I'm sorry. But, but I like guns. I never shot anything, but I like to shoot them. And I had a gun in my car. 
And I laid that gun, it was a 45, I laid it in my, in my lap, and I thought, I'm going to go in, I'm going to rob this pharmacy. Do I look like a guy that would rob a pharmacy? Hope not. But I was going to. I was that close. Uh, Jackie Karen doesn't know this. I got a feeling she's going to find out. I laid that gun there in my lap, and I thought about going in and robbing that pharmacy. That's how desperate I was. And then I had a moment of clarity, and I said, if I do that, I won't ever have a chance. And, and I didn't do it. I went back. I was sick for two more days, and Karen drove all the way home. You would think that that would be a wake-up call getting to that point, but I can tell you on the way home, I made her drive all the way. It was about 12 hours. I got on the phone with a guy that I knew had some pills, and I had him plant them at my house so I'd get better as soon as I got home. That's what drug addiction does to you. Uh, a miserable way uh, to live your life. My dad intervened on me. Uh, my friends, my colleagues all saw something was wrong with me. I weighed 173 pounds at the time. Uh, you can see right now I'm a little north of 173, a little more healthy. But I weighed 173 pounds, and friends and colleagues knew something was wrong, but nobody stepped up. They were scared to or didn't know for sure, didn't want to get involved, and my dad knew something was wrong. And so I took Heath, my son, down to Jonesboro, and, and I was going to drop him off to go hiking with my father. And um, I carried my, my pills in the, in, the, in the cup holder of my truck. And I want you to think about how, how arrogant that is. And I had them there, and there's this bowl over, no prescription bottles or anything. They're just right there. And I dropped Heath off at, at White Store in Jonesboro, those of you who knows where, where, know where that is. And Dad came over and got him, and, and I could have sworn that they walked away. I still in my mind right now. I can see the back of them. I know they walked away. And I was getting a little shaky because now, you know, three years later, I'm not taking drugs to get high. I'm not taking drugs to feel good. I'm taking drugs to not be sick. That's why I'm taking them. So Dad walked off. I reached over. I grabbed 15 10 milligram Percocets, the yellow bars, 15 of them at one time, boom, in my mouth all at once. And when I turned around, my dad was standing right there. And he said, Steve, he said, you just take a hand, handful of pain pills? And I looked at him and said, no. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> I said, no. Right. That's what drug addiction does to you. He just saw me do it. Right. He just saw me do it. He turns around, walks off. I drive home. I work the next day. I come home and I turn the corner. I look up, up on the hill at my house and I see his truck sitting in my driveway. And I'm like, uh-oh. I knew what he was there for before I even got there. And I pulled up in the driveway. He said, Steve, I need, we need to go to your sister's. I said, I don't want to go see her. I hadn't talked to her in 10 years. I didn't, damn sure didn't want to see her. He said, no, he said, we need to go see her. So he put me in his truck, and we were driving down the road, and we got out to about where uh, uh, I-26 is there on the state of Franklin. And he said, Steve, he said, do you have a drug problem? I said, no, Dad, I don't have a drug problem. He shook his head, yes. And we went on up the interstate. We're still driving to Becky's. And, and he said, uh, put his hand over on my knee, and he said, uh, Steve, he said, uh, you've got a drug problem. And I just started crying. Uh, I felt like a guy in the middle of the ocean that, that suddenly looked up, and, and there was a ship coming by that, that slung out a life preserver. You know, I thought I was going to lose my wife. I thought I was going to lose my kids. I thought I was going to lose everything I ever worked for, my medical license, you name it, it was all gone. But the big thing I felt was I, ha I felt a sense of relief. Somebody knew. I'm not in the shadows anymore, and, and I had no idea where it was going to go from that moment, but I knew at least somebody knew. Uh, I bawled all the way to Kingsport. Uh, when I opened the door to my sister's office, she hugged me, told me she loved me, and by the way, Becky and I have a very close relationship right now. Not a week goes by that I don't talk to her. Things change so much so quickly whenever you remove substances from the, from the plan. And we started calling around. I didn't know where to get help. And keep in mind, I'd been to medical school and residency and had no clue where to go get help. Wound up calling Jack Woodside. Went into Jack's office the next day, and we, put, we uh, decided that the place for me was a place called CPE in Nashville. And uh, I went down there. I spent five and a half days in the detox unit at Vanderbilt withdrawing from opiates and benzos. I got five, nine shots of medication in my left arm over three days. And the thing I take away, uh, take away from Vita is that out of all the people on those floors at Vita, and I think there were 24 patients, there was only one patient that got to go to a rehab after those five days, and that was me. The rest of those kids went back to the street. The rest of them went back to the street. My next-door neighbor there, a pretty young girl, she was 19 years old. She had big MRSA abscesses on her arm from injection drug use, and she was HIV positive. And before I left, she brought me a picture, uh, a picture, and she wanted to show me, uh, she wanted to show me a picture of her when she was clean. It was at her junior prom. 
I think about her all the time, all the time. Where is she now? Because she wasn't given the opportunities that I was given. Going to Vita was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me because I realized in there that the line separating me from the other people I saw in the room, most of them had come out of jail, was virtually non-existent. Just by the grace of God, in my point, and, and, and bad luck on their time. I got to, got to, got to CPE, I met Chip, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of what, what Chip taught me, but, but Chip taught us, the thing I do want to cover is Chip taught us about our feelings. Before we know God, before we know other human beings, we've got to know our own heart first. And until you do that, you've got no hope at relationship with anybody else. And he taught me that I have eight feelings. And one of those feelings is anger. And anger is a good thing because healthy anger and the spiritual gift of anger is passion. And Jesus Christ was the most angry man in the Bible. No doubt. Unhealthy anger is depression. Clinical depression. He taught me that, that fear, the spiritual gift of fear is judgment, wisdom. The impaired state of fear is anxiety and rage. And I'd been living over here in the impaired state because that's all I'd ever known. And if you live over here, and instead of passion and judgment and wisdom, you have, you have, uh, you have uh, anxiety, rage, and depression, you're only going to do that so long before you start to medicate it. And it made sense to me. And I'm thinking, okay, that makes sense. And I started getting in touch with my feelings. But I kept my secrets from him. I kept one secret till August 16, 2004. It was my last one. And we used to joke that, that Chip could be the, he, he could get us to confess to being the 20th hijacker. You know, when he started looking at you, it was over. I mean, it was like he could see straight through you. And I kept having a dream about my worst secret. And this is the thing I haven't told in public before. I think I may have told you, Deanna. But this is it. I started having dreams about it, and I knew I had to talk to Chip. And, and this is where you guys come in, because I want you to think about this. Chip met me where I was at that moment. I walked in one morning. I said, Chip, I need to talk to you. He said, all right. So we go back in his office, and I'm sitting there in his office. And over his, over his shoulder, he's got a great big picture, a painted picture of the prodigal son. I'm sitting there looking at that picture of the prodigal son and getting ready to tell him the secret that I thought I would never tell anybody as long as I lived. And it is this. I stole drugs from a dying cancer patient. Not only I stole drugs from a dying cancer patient, he was probably my favorite professor in medical school. He picked me as a doctor whenever he, uh, whenever he needed a doctor when I got out of medical school. And he's known all the doctors that graduated from Quillen since 1982, and he picked me. He came to see me not long after I became my patient. He had a, an eye finding that I knew was, was bad news. And it turns out that he had metastatic cancer. And I took care of him until he died. But I used to go over to his house, and I took medication for his pain, and I took it myself. Now, I replaced it. I wrote him another prescription, so I really wasn't stealing it, right? Well, no, not right at all. I stole medication from a dying pan cancer patient, and he died before I could, before I could make amends. And I told that to Chip, and Chip's sitting there about, about where you are, Rob, and he had on a blue shirt, and he's scanning, it, scanning me with those eyes. He leans forward, and he said, Knucklehead. He called me Knucklehead. He said, uh, Knucklehead, that's bad. He didn't tell me it was okay. He didn't tell me it would be over. all right. He said, Knucklehead, that's bad. He said, but I forgive you. God forgives you, and I love you. First time in my life I, anybody ever told me that, that I believed it. It changed my life. The one thing that he said changed my life. Because in my world, the way I'd been brought up was that people forgave you right up until the point they needed to stick you with it to get them to do something they wanted to do. It was always about shame. It was always about coming back at you. Oh, you remember when you did this to get you to behave in a way that they wanted you to behave. Guys, that was a turning point in my life. He met me where I was. We have to meet people where they are. I don't care what the situation. I've been in alleys with prostitutes. I've been, uh, I've been in my office. Uh, I've gone out to people's houses. I meet them where they are with no judgment. I went down to Greene County uh, uh, several months ago because they were talking about opening up a treatment facility there, and they said uh, they were opposed to it. Now, the Greene County is opposed to treatment. I mean, come on. Your whole county's addicted. Right? You propose a, a treatment facility to open up, and one of, the, one of the town administrators there looked at me and he said, Jesus wouldn't try to help the alcoholic from behind the bar. I said, I respectfully disagree because I think that he would, and the people I know, I, I think they would as well. How's my life now? My life now is a dream to me. Um, in the past year, uh, I got to go to the White House three times, uh, which is, I walk in there and every time I, I've got tears coming down because I can't believe I'm there. I can't believe that I'm not laying in an alley dead. I can't believe that I'm not in jail. Uh, I'm the chief of medicine at the VA. Every morning I walk in my office, I take a big sigh, I breathe out, and I'm like, man, I can't believe I get to do this job today. Now at lunchtime, I feel a little different. but. <laughs> But at that moment, 
My life is unrecognizable to me. I get to actually step into people, meet them where they are, and start to form meaningful relationship. And guys, that is the best part of being a doctor. I don't care about anything else. I care about that. Uh, my son and daughter have never seen me take a drink. Never remember me taking a drink, never remember me taking a pill, and I didn't miss anything while they were growing up. And next June the 26th, I'm going to walk my daughter down the aisle. It's my last responsibility as a dad, and I'm going to be there, and I will not miss it. Guys, we've got to help people, and we've got to stop letting them miss the things that make our lives great. With that said, I'm going to go to my friend Daryl Smith. Sorry, I was chomping ice. My son hates that. Um, this is Daryl and Misty Smith. Uh, I met Daryl about three years ago. Yeah. I guess it's a time. And, and if you ask me the, the, peop the five people that I admire most in this world, I can guarantee you Daryl Smith's on that list. Daryl, a little bit about your family. When, when was your first drug use? Probably about 13, 14 year old. What, what, what did you do? Uh, drank in marijuana. Okay. Now, y your friends at the time, were they drinkers and, and marijuana users? Yeah. Okay. What about your mom and dad? They divorced when I was about 14, 14 15 year old. And that's, that's kind of when, you know, I went buck wild. Just, I got the freedom then to get out and rip and run, you know. Well, how could you really rip and run, Daryl? I mean, you're 14 years old. Uh, your parents are divorced, but your mom's still at home, isn't she? Sometimes, yeah. But like I was telling you before, you know, she went to Corbin on the weekend. She'd leave me there. So I pretty much had run of the house. And sometimes I'd take her down there and sometimes not, you know. So you were, you were 14 years old. Your mom had a – how far is Corbin from where you lived? About an hour and a half. Okay, so you, you were 14 years old. Your mom uh, would go an hour and a half away and leave you home by yourself all weekend? Yes. How, how did she get to, to Corbin? Either I'd drive her down there and bring the vehicle back so I'd have a vehicle or she would take the vehicle. But just... is, the, is the driving age in Kentucky 14? <laughs> <laughs> Not the last I checked. No. <laughs> So you, were, as a 14-year-old, you've already started using alcohol and marijuana. You've got parents that have gotten divorced. And your mom has a boyfriend that lives an hour and a half away and will leave you on the weekends. And then you drive her an hour and a half there, drop her off, come back home by yourself without a license to be by yourself all weekend. And then you go back and pick her up from her boyfriend's? Is yeah, that accurate? That's pretty accurate. Okay. What about your dad? He's not in your life. I know they're divorced. What, 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 what was his past like? He, yeah, he just, he's been an alcoholic since I was, since I was born, I guess. I mean, back when that, when him and mom was together, he only drunk on the weekends. But then after they split up, he's, he's drunk every day, ever since, I guess. Drink all day long, every day? Pretty much, yeah. Right. So, so your life went on like that with, with drinking and, and, and drug use. How old were you when you got in, took your first pill? I want to say 15, maybe 16. And what was it? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's something with codeine in it. Okay. Um, Fiorinol. Fiorinol. Okay. Fiorinol. And do where, where, you remember where you got it? Yeah. Where did it come from? I got it. I was selling weed for. All right. So, so you're, you're, did you finish high school? No. So what, what happened there? No, the first year they called my mom in, said I couldn't, you know, I'd missed too much. I didn't have no chance of passing or anything to go ahead and sign me out. I went back the next year, and I was just obliviated when I went in. So you're uh, talking about freshman in high school, 14 years old, 15 years old? No, I did 15. 15? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now I was 15 when she signed me out. Then I, the next year, I think I might have been 16. I, I got 
so now now you're out of school with no nothing structurally going on during your day. Your mom's still absentee. Tell me about your mom's drug use. Okay, she eventually did though, or, she, or just selling. Okay, all right. So you're tell tell me uh, going forward. Let's move forward to August of 1995. Tell me about that day. That's it. Oh, I'm sorry, October. That's right. right. <laughs> You're trying to remember August, all right? Tell me, tell me about August the 13th or 14th, somewhere in there. Then October the 13th, well, 20 years ago today, I robbed a convenience store, got shot. Got sentenced to 10 years in prison. Uh, bad day. <laughs> and I think it's, I, I didn't know this when, whenever, uh, whenever we put this together, but that was 20 years ago today, to the yeah. day. Uh, it was actually, uh, actually Daryl's 20th birthday, wasn't it? Yeah, well, my, we were celebrating my birthday at night. My birthday's on the 11th, but uh, yeah, it's my birthday party. So, so you you strong armed robbery uh, a store, right, with a gun. With a hand, yeah. Okay, and the police chase you down. You tell uh, tell us about tell us about how how that transpired and how you wound up getting shot. Well, he gets behind us about a mile past the store, and pulls us over, and he gets my gets my getaway driver out. I couldn't get out because my door handle was broke. He has me slide across the seat to exit the car and I was shoving money down in the seat. I'd already thrown my gun out by the way, but uh, anyway, I was sliding out to get out of the car. I was shoving money down in the seat and he thought I was reaching for another gun. So he grabs me, pulls me out and that's why I get shot. So, and you got shot in the arm? Yeah, you got shot here. Yeah. You still see yeah, the, yeah. still see the, see the scars. When when Daryl comes in my office and I see him every time he walks in, I tell him the same thing. I can't believe this is him. Doesn't look like that, does he? Not at all. No, Don't he's you? a different person. And, and pay doubt. attention to the Rat Park. Daryl's Rat Park. You know, how many of you let your 14 year old drive to Knoxville and drop you off at your boyfriend or girlfriend's house and then drive home and left him alone for the weekend? These are things that I had no clue of when I got into addiction medicine. So how long did you go to prison for? I received a 10-year sentence, but after three years, I made parole. So, so any, did you receive any kind of, of treatment in prison for your, for your drug addiction? The last six months before I got out, they did send me through a substance abuse program, which consisted of, I think, three AA meetings a week. And I think you had to do a workbook. It wasn't nothing... Major, you know, just so, so Daryl's treatment program was was a few years of prison and the last six months a workbook to work through and and AA meetings. Um, I wouldn't have lasted 20 minutes. How long did you last when you got out? I want to say about 11 months. Okay. And then and then what happened that that kind of drug you back? Just uh, had a toothache, got a few lower taps from the doctor. And I had access to them anyway because at that time was when my mom was dealing. So your mom is, is dealing yeah. in pills now? Right, and I was keeping them over at my house. So if the police come in, they wouldn't get just a small amount, you know. So, so, you're, so you, you get released from prison back into a home or back into a situation where your mom is dealing in pills... Mm -hmm. And then she has you keep the pills and the money so we, you don't have too much on any single right. one person. Exactly. Cool. Tell, me, tell me what happened from there. Just. Hmm. What was that? <laughs> That's how you would tell him how many he was using. Right? Yeah. yeah, oh, how, yeah. How, when, you, when you started back using pills at that many times, how much were you using? I don't know, 20 to 30, 20s a day. So, I mean. So, so if you think about that, you're using 20 to 30 oxycodone, 20 milligrams per day. If you mul multiply out the morphine equivalents of that, that's 900 morphine equivalents per day. So those of you who don't understand what morphine equivalents are, they're a way to standardize 
uh, the different potencies of all these opioid narcotics that we have out here. So, uh, and to give you some example of how, how lucky Daryl and I both are to be sitting here in front of you, 100 morphine equivalents. When you get up to 100 morphine equivalents per day, your risk of dying from accidental drug overdose is 9 to 14 fold higher than somebody taking 40 milli equivalents per day. Okay, that's, that's at 100. Daryl's taken 900. Heist Ivory got to with 750. So in, uh, at one point during your, during your, during your pill dealing, uh, you had how many pills would you have sometimes in, in the trailer and how much in cash? At any one given time, up to 50000 in cash and just pills galore. I mean, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 pills. Okay. You, you were telling me earlier about, uh, about somebody who brought you, yeah, uh, brought you pills. Brought How'd them they bring to them to us. you? Brought them, brought them to us in milk jugs. <laughs> There's a lot of pills in milk jugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, why don't you imagine this? So here's your, your supplier yeah. coming in with a couple of milk jugs full of pills. No, uh, you would go to a back of his car to get them, but yeah. <laughs> and just pack them around. But. <laughs> so so those, those pills, where did they come from? The best of my knowledge up north. But you also had people around, older people, who would sell you oh, their prescriptions. Yeah. yeah, we had several that would stop at our house on the way home, you know, from the doctor. We had people going to Mexico and getting them to uh, Florida. You pay their transfer down there and whatnot. And when you, uh, Daryl, your, your, your pill dealing gig uh, expired on you, how, yeah. did, how did that happen? <laughs> I went to work. Well, they busted my mom, the feds. She went to prison, and then they had a state-level roundup. I went to work one day, and I seen that bus down there, and that's what they was doing, was rounding everybody up. They come to my house. They got my wife at that time. They had a couple of charges on her. And I got a few voicemails later saying they was looking for me, too. So that was the end of it. Who turned you in? My best man at my wedding. So Daryl, Daryl's best man at his med wedding wore a wire uh, to get him caught uh, dealing narcotics. Uh, I think you can see Rat Park uh, taking shape here. First, first uh, jail, multiple years in prison, no, no attempt at rehab other than a workbook. And now, guess what? Daryl winds up back in jail. Is that a surprise? It's predictable. It's where I'm supposed to be. It's where you're supposed to be. Matter of fact, they tell you they'll see you on the day right. that they turn you out. Oh, yeah. And so this is a big topic in the election right now is prison reform. The United States incarcerates more people than anybody in the world. It's not even close. And most of them are nonviolent, or in Daryl's case, actually violent drug offenders. Yeah. I hear people say all the time that you can't rehabilitate somebody who's been a violent drug offender. Well, I would disagree. I think that you can, particularly when it's driven by their, by their drug use. Um, there you got out in, in 2004, and it, this is one of the saddest stories that, that we have. You got out in 2004, you met Misty, mm -hmm. okay? And y your first day out, what happened? Buddy. <laughs> first day, now they, they just first turned you loose, out, yeah. right? First day out, I went to see my mom. The drug dealer? Yeah. Okay. The guy pulled up, no pickup truck, he just got a settlement. He said, ride up the road with me and check out my new truck. Didn't even know I'd been gone for two years. I showed you how good friends, but anyway, we go up the road and he throws me a bottle of 40s and said, uh, crush this up for him. So th th threw him a bottle of 40 milligram oxycodone and said what? Said crush this up for him. And it was on from then, you know. I was right back where I left off, you know. So the, the day out of prison, I picked up, handed 40s right there with nothing to fall back on. You want to talk about a, a rat park that's right for somebody going back. Uh, I can't describe it any better. Uh, I'm going to uh, get, run through a few things here real quickly because I want to sure. get, get, get to the end. Darrell started using Xanax in, in 2006. So he's combining Xanax, methadone, and roxycodone. I mean, if you look at drug overdoses in the United States, no. that is the number one combination found in drug overdose deaths. And that's what uh, Darrell has taken at that time. He and Misty had a, 
uh, were pregnant, had a, a baby that, that uh, two sets of doctors tried to get them abort to abort because of uh, abnormal findings on ultrasounds and amniotic fluid exams, and they decided not to. By the way, that little boy is nine years old today and in school. Um, and uh, they decided not to do that. They decided to stick to their guns. But they had an interesting story about the Ronald McDonald House that you, you stayed at because I'm trying to give you all a flavor because if you go through your life like I went through my life, I didn't know any of this stuff was happening. I, I, I'm clueless. I'm walking through life. I'm involved in Steve Lloyd. I didn't know any of this other stuff was out there. So tell us about the Ronald McDonald House. Oh, the, the Ronald McDonald House was the Ronald McDonald House was a wonderful place for us. Um, after we found out that our son did have some medical problems. Um, he was diagnosed with a very rare kidney disease. Um, we spent 27 days while we were, after, well, we, I was in the hospital for two months before he was born, but afterwards we stayed 27 days at the Ronald McDonald House, which is a wonderful place for anyone that, that has a medical need or they have children that, that need to be there. It's a wonderful place. But at the same time, you're exposed to a lot of, of drug addicted mothers, um, people that, that, have, that have come from walks of life like Daryl. So we're there, and not only do you have people that were addicted to drugs, and that's why they were there, but you have C-section moms and moms that were in labor for hours and hours and hours, and, and they're given drugs, too, you know, to, to help with pain or whatnot. So we're there, and everything looks normal, but you do have all of these people that from all different walks of life. And it was, it was literally, it was like after the sun went down, all the people come out to play. And so we went to the Ronald McDonald House one night, and it was after 12 o'clock, and there was so many people there, and they, and they were high, and they were passing out pills. And as someone that's not addicted to drugs and with someone that is, it, was, it doesn't matter how hard you try to prevent them from getting into that situation, they're going to get there. They were handing them out like candy, even to the point that Daryl was saying, she really does do drugs. Don't worry about it. Give me what she's taking. You know? <laughs> and, Sh chivalry and, is not dead. Right? <laughs> right. And so, and so um, you get in the situations anywhere. It doesn't have to be at home. It doesn't have to be with your family. It can literally be hours away in a place that you would never think it's going to happen. And he's high as a kite. And so it, it was crazy. Uh, and, and that's what I want to point out is that You've taken somebody here with, with serious addictive disease, put them in environments where it's all around and not given them any tools to handle those environments. And in, while every time that we keep doing that, we're going to get the same result. I've had 11 years of learning how to deal with situations like that. I have cancer patients that bring in medication and put it right, on, right in front of me, and it is my drug of choice. Do I take it? No. I've built things in around that. But it took a long time for me to get there. And somebody like Daryl Smith has never had that opportunity. He's never had anybody guide me. And so what do you do? He used drugs. Well, guess what? That's predictable. It'll happen 100 times out of 100. I'm going to fast forward, Daryl, to 2008. Was a was a pretty tough year for you. Uh, lost a very good job to your drug abuse. Yeah. Then lost another job. And then uh, it looked like at that point that you decided it was time to get better. Yeah, she... Well, she come up pregnant with her second child. That was, I think she was four months pregnant when I finally went to the detox. <clears throat> How long did you get to stay at detox, by the way? Uh, five days. And, and where did you go when you got done with that detox? I don't know. All right. See, now, I'd been through that detox two or three times, but I, I always same result. I come home, right. it's on. Can, I, so I want to make one point about that, Daryl. If you look at people that you put in and just get them off of the drug and don't do anything else, it's no. about 100% relapse, and Daryl did it three times. It, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Every time. This time, I had a plan when I come out. I had a place willing to accept me into a suboxone treatment program. Uh, it's, it's saved my life without a doubt. Uh, there's... I, Either be back in prison or dead. I mean, there's no, there's no way I'd be here. No way I'd own my own store now. Um, you know, I, there's just no way. 
Misty, when you were trying to get Daryl in somewhere, can you tell, tell the folks uh, briefly about the, the phone call that yeah. you made? Um, once Daryl's addiction had reached, it, it had reached such a level that, that we didn't speak. Um, our, our son knew Dad as the guy that slept in the recliner. Um, we had reached wit's end. He had, I had. There were so many nights that I laid with my hand on his chest while he slept to make sure he would wake up the next day. I loved him, and I wanted him to get better. But it didn't matter how many times I said, you've got to do this. You've got to do this for me. You've got to do this for the baby. You've got to do the, this for the baby that's coming. It didn't matter because just like do Dr. Lloyd said, with the addiction, it takes over everything. It takes over everything. He loved me, and he loved our he loved our baby more than life. You know, the doctors tried to make us abort him, and we did, and we loved him that much. But his drug addiction had got so bad, I and so I said, more. he loved the pill more, yeah, and I, I was ready to leave and take our babies elsewhere. And I got on the phone, and he finally agreed to treatment, finally agreed to do something, and he said, I don't want to live like this anymore. And I sit down in the corner of my bathroom, as far over in the corner as I could get with my phone, and I begged that nurse to take my husband. They didn't want to take him at, a, at the hospital where we live because he wasn't suicidal. He wasn't standing there with a the knife threatening to kill himself, but he was killing himself every day. They didn't want to take him into another, into just a straight program because he had to go through some kind of detox. There was a six months waiting period for him to get in just to see a doctor that, that would take care of him and we didn't have six months. He didn't have six months of life. We didn't have six months of marriage. Something had to be done. So I begged and I begged that nurse until she let him go, until she said, okay, We'll take him. I said, my kids are losing their dad, and I'm losing my husband, and a mom's losing a dad, or, or a son. There's, We've got to do something. And so they finally got him in, and after five days, they sent him home. And I was devastated, not because my husband was coming home, but because I knew that without some kind of intervention, <coughs> I couldn't, I couldn't save him by myself. And that's when he found Dr. Lloyd and, and he found Suboxone and it did change his world. He did become a dad. He did become a husband. He went to sleep every night and I knew that unless God made other plans, he was going to wake up the next day. It wasn't going to be because he took his own life in an effort to make himself feel better. Misty, what about um, what about Daryl now? Um, Daryl now is a totally different perspective of anyone that you would ever see. We we have our own business um, that has been thriving for um, over a year now. We own four rental properties, and more than that, he's he's a dad. Our kids get to spend time with him. Um, people that come into our business knows nothing about Daryl's past. Um, some of them do, but most of them don't. He's just another walk of life that we all experience every day. But um, he, he's there. We, we're financially okay. We're emotionally okay. I would think that we're probably stronger in our marriage now than we've oh, ever yeah. been. Um, our kids have anything that they want, and it's it really is about having having a support system, and and not just family, but but a medical team too that's willing somebody to believe in you. It, it's it's detrimental. I think you told me you actually have money in the bank. Is that is there any way that's possible? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I I remember I remember being so scared I would go to the grocery store while Daryl was on while Daryl was in his addiction 
and I would go to the grocery store and buy things that we absolutely had to have for the house, you know, swab, shampoo, and, and hamburger meat, lots and lots of hamburger meat, hamburger everything, because <laughs> it was cheap. And, and I felt myself enabling his addiction, not that I was addicted or that I wanted him to be, but I wanted him to be okay. I wanted, I wanted him to not be sick. I didn't want him laying in the bed for hours. And so I, I, always, I, I was always real iffy about what I spent. And, and still, I, I think I still carry some of that with me. But now, you know, if, if we go to Walmart and our babies want a toy, it's not, wait, you, can, you know, you can't have that right now. We don't really have that much money right now. You can't have that, you know. And it, it makes a big difference. Big, big, big difference. So that's... That's why I wanted you to, to hear Daryl and Misty, because Daryl is Daryl takes a, a medication. I've I've known him for for over three years now. Um, he's one of my my favorite patients. Uh, what Daryl has been able to do with with the only help that he's really had is 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 medication and and yeah. us. That's it, and it's the lowest common denominator. And, and there's so much more that I know that he can do going forward. But but he never would have had that opportunity. And and it's one of the things that I wanted to bring forth in front of you guys to contrast how I was treated and how Daryl Smith uh, has been treated. And we see things in the paper all the time about you know medication this, medication that. It's bad. When they're going to come off? I want to ask you this. I want to know if there's anybody in the room that can honestly tell me that Daryl Smith is not in recovery because he takes one pill a day. Daryl, Daryl's wife, and I can tell you, I had to watch them early this morning. They love each other, okay? They kiss each other. They hold hands. Matter of fact, I was a little jealous that me and my wife don't behave like that. <laughs> they have money in the bank. He's got a thriving business. His kids know where he is. He does things with his family. He is a family guy. He has a life. Who in the room is going to tell him that he's not in recovery? Because, guys, at that point, I could no longer do that. Um, it's like a diabetic that takes an insulin shot every day because his liver doesn't, or because his pancreas doesn't make insulin. It's what he does to, to, to get by, to give him a chance at, at his life. And so I can tell you that, that no matter what you see out there, no matter what you see in the newspapers, no matter what judges say, they don't see the whole picture. Because I can tell you this, Tim Smythe can tell you this, there's a lot of Daryl Smiths out there, a lot. And we shouldn't have to get on the phone and beg for their life. We shouldn't have to ask, uh, please save them or they're going to die. So that's what I'd like to leave you with. Um, Daryl, thank you. I do thank admire you. you. Misty, thank you. I challenge you, challenge you with this uh, going forward out of here right now. Um, get rid of the things that are, that are dragging you down that, that, that hinder you from meeting people where they're at. The most important thing that we can do when dealing with people with substance abuse is to stop shaming them and meet them where they're at. Thank you.